Good morning, Sycamore Creek. I'm Carola, your communications guru, and I'm here today with my co-host, Erin Wassinger. Thank you. Good morning. When you're looking up at the night sky and you see all the clouds because we live in the city, um, or maybe sometimes the stars come out or the moon, but what do those things point to? Today we're talking about science and the question of God and what that means, and we want you to like and share and subscribe so that you can know when we're going live and when uh, we have cool new music videos to post, like this one we're about to show you. While we listen to Jacqueline Lee absolutely kill this Frank Sinatra classic, comment about how much you would pay to go to the moon. Think about that while we tune in to this. Gosh, it's what too perfect. Yes. It's too perfectly it. covered. That's Jacqueline Lee, everybody. Shout out to Jacqueline <laughs> Lee. That's just oh, my heart. I would pay a lot of money to go to the moon or to space in general. I love space. I, I'm mystified by the cosmos. Yeah, you're pretty jealous of my space camp experience. I am exceptionally actually. jealous. And because I've been to space camp, I'm going to wait for the Groupon to come because I've already done that stuff. You're you like <laughs> space camp? Yeah. A dime a dozen. Yeah. Space. Listen, you guys, I think space is super cool, but I maybe go to 500, but I'm like so used to being a broke college kid. Oh, and yes. like also I'm a theater person. So I'm like, you know mm -hmm. what? I'll wait until that comes next year. Yeah. We're or like, lottery. I'll wait till the yeah. tickets go on sale. But we've got some great comments in here. Dwayne says, what an experience. You couldn't put a price on that. Mm, except um, they do. <laughs> right. They do. Yeah. Tom Arthur says $1,000. Okay, very mm -hmm. reasonable, Tom. You couldn't pay me to go to space. This is Kristen Cracky. Height plus space? <laughs> nope. There's nope. there's that fear factor, that unknown, right, of space. Yes. It's, do we it's, get to come back? Is that included? Well, one would hope. The price? Okay. One would hope. Okay. Speaking of coming back... Aaron, tell us how we can come back to Sycamore Creek. Oh boy, there are so many ways. You can connect <laughs> online with us. Here is our website. You can also send your prayers to prayers at sycamorecreekchurch.org and you can text us at the number on your screen. As well, oh, this is so much fun. Okay, so we turned 20 in November. Happy birthday. <gasps> Yay, happy birthday to us. And as a way to celebrate, the first 20 new people who fill out a connection card get to choose from four charities who we're going to give 20 bucks to. Yes. So, so we've got all of that. It makes more sense to fill this out and help the universe become a better place. Yeah. Okay. So you can do that at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect. As well, if you're a first time guest, we're going to send you a free book as well. 
appropriately for this year called You'll Get Through This by Maxi Max Lucado. Maxi Max. Maxi Max. Yeah, yeah. The Maxist of the Max. (laughs) He's pretty epic. He's pretty Max. Um, So if you're a first time guest, fill that out. Also, post your selfie, hashtag SCCMI. Here are some of our fun favorites. And you might get chosen as our selfie of the week and get that $5 Big B gift card. $5 Big B gift card. Winner from last week, Paul McWilson. It's technically not a selfie. I mean, he's got like a picture. And we love this post about, you know, fitting into Sycamore Creek. You belong here. What a great message. We loved that so much. And he used the hashtag. So awesome job, Paul. Nice job, Paul. Share this video. You can also share this video. Please comment because it's way more fun when we're all involved here. Engage with us in the comment section. Please do. And with that, our message begins with this. Peace, friends. I'm Pastor Tom Arthur from Sycamore Creek Church in Lansing, Michigan. And my wife, Sarah, loves looking at the stars. She loves stargazing, looking up into the night sky. She knows all of the constellations. She recently downloaded an app for the boys to learn the constellations as well. She'll let them stay up really late just to see something unique in the sky. In fact, she'll go so far as to wake them up in the middle of the night to get some particularly amazing view of Mars. It's not uncommon to find her in the cold night air on our front porch, staring through a little tube at the heavens. A couple of weeks ago, she drove out to a cemetery out in the country all by herself to get a particularly dark view of this night sky. And when she got out there and got into the cemetery, she ended up getting scared and getting back in the car and driving back home. She grew up up north and her family taught her all of the things to look for in the night sky. I grew up in the city of Indianapolis where you were lucky to see any stars in the middle of the night. But when I moved to Petoskey up north and began spending more time in the wilderness, I became, well, not quite as interested in the night sky as Sarah is, but interested in what the night sky told us about God. The first longer portion of the Bible that I ever memorized was Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. I wonder what's your favorite thing in creation to look at and and admire? Is Is it the stars, the sunrise, the sunset, the ocean, something else? Let's have a conversation about that in the comments. Let's talk about it. My favorite thing to admire in creation and and look at, um, gosh, I I mean, we're spoiled here in Michigan because we have these beautiful landscapes, mountains, um, not ocean, but these large lakes that stretch across the land. I regularly vacation with my family up north at Glen Lake. And um, one year when I was 13, as you can see. <laughs> Baby Carol. <laughs> me. I had very like Hermione Granger hair. Um, it was a fun time for me. Um, <laughs> we stayed up. It was my cousin and my, my aunt and we watched the sunset and we watched the moon rise and watched the moon set. And then there was a meteor shower and the stars up there, it's like you're in a 
like a panoramic of the sky. You're like in a bowl and it's so dark, you can see everything. So we watched the stars for quite a while. And then we fell asleep. We went to bed for a couple hours, drove around the lake to watch the sunrise and then went to breakfast. One of the best experiences. I'm so jealous. So um, we all know I'm not a morning person, so I'm not getting up for no sunset. But I think that, or sunrise, excuse me. I think Either. that the sunset is gorgeous. I love the colors. And uh, mm -hmm. recently we were driving home and Hope noticed the, the colors of the sky. And she was like, Mom, look, it's pink and orange oh, and yes. blue. And it was like this awe of wonder in her voice. We've got some great comments as well on um, Facebook. People are saying, uh, I'll pick the ocean, uh, Breezy Silver says. Mm -hmm. And lots of people talking love about the, the stars. I love hearing what people say. Oh, ocean waves at sunset, Christina ocean. Williams says. Beautiful. When the, you can see the crest of color. Oh, on the waves. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Nobody said my favorite. Baby animals. Baby animals. I mean, come on. Like in the wild when in you're, the wild, when you're when on you, a hike. Yes, and you come oh across like a baby deer. Yes. Oh, I, got Beautiful. I love that. Beautiful. Mm. Let's continue to listen about God's creation. I love hearing what you like to admire in creation. When you look up at the night sky or anywhere, at least when I do, I see God's fingerprints all over it, kind of like a toddler with their fingerprints all over a glass door. Or do you? Not everyone sees God's fingerprints in the heavens. Some scientists and philosophers liken seeing God in the sky to believing in a giant teapot that's orbiting around the earth. Hank Green of Crash Course, the PBS internet show, presents the opposite philosophical case for not believing in God. Watch and listen. Before we go, I want to head to the Thought Bubble for some flash philosophy. Our old friend Bertrand Russell once posited the existence of a China teapot orbiting the sun somewhere between Earth and Mars. Let's say that back on Earth there were a bunch of teapotists, people who argued that since we can't disprove the teapot's existence, they were justified in believing in it. Not only that, they constructed great buildings, erected statues, composed songs, held weekly services, and appealed to the teapot for help in their daily lives. But everyone else thought the teapotists were ridiculous because there was no evidence to support their belief in the teapot. For their part, the teapotists just replied that none of the A teapotists could prove that it wasn't there. Thanks, Thought Bubble. And I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Pragmatism, where the leap to faith might be a solution to the problem of God's existence if you're not satisfied with any of the other more evidence-based arguments, but believing in something because it's expedient or because it frees you from having to have any reasons at all can still have its risks. After all, if we can leap to God, we can also leap to Russell's teapot or to the flying spaghetti monster. Or much worse, we could leap to particular beliefs about God, like that he wants us to deny rights to certain kinds of people or kill them. These beliefs aren't representative of the views of most theists, but the problem is if you're giving up on reasons and evidence, all beliefs are philosophically equal. We count on evidence and justification to help us adjudicate between beliefs, to decide what we value. If you throw that out and fall back on faith alone, the sum of your religious arguments is going to end up being, I have faith in the things I choose to have faith in. And in that case, no one can tell anyone else that their belief is wrong or dangerous or unjustified because you can't justify faith. Hank Green makes a strong case. Can you justify faith? Is there evidence for belief? I'm curious what you think. Let's talk about that. justify faith that's a really deep question this early in the morning oh yeah oh man I feel like there's things we can't explain not enough at least not sufficiently um, I don't know if that's evidence for belief I also man I used to really enjoy those history channel shows where like they're like we've uncovered a new Bible book in the desert and I was like <laughs> tell me more who wrote it, <laughs> see it. it's evidence I do enjoy the that history stuff. yes yeah. I just love you Carol you're such a nerd in such a good way <laughs> it's true you know I honestly think that like our very existence is evidence for faith or justification for faith. There's so many things in this world that are unexplainable. We, I mean, we just talked about miracles last week 
And True. I remember when we were discussing it during the week, like we had trouble coming up with them. But then as the week went on, I just came up with more and more and more examples mm -hmm. of miracles. I love what Dwayne says. You can always justify faith. It's faith that gives us hope. Mm, um, somebody lovely. else said a seed growing into a plant Jeez. that feeds us wow what right? a good like yeah just amazing that's beautiful it's a poetic of growth i'm stuck on the question though because like yeah. if you have to justify faith then is it faith is it like, faith at all if you have question. evidence for it is it really mm. belief i'm gonna be that annoying kid in the back of let's the class. find out if there's an answer mm. to this anytime you go beyond the evidence you justify it that's faith you have to go beyond reason, but not against reason. So a priest and a physicist walk into a bar. You complete the joke. <laughs> I love this series that we're in. We've had several people on my Facebook page complete the joke. Here's some of them. Now, to understand this one, you got to understand a little bit of geeky science, all right? A neutrino is so small that 100 trillion go through your body every second. And one can go through seven light years of steel without ever touching anything. All right, so with that little bit of science knowledge, here's the joke. A priest and a physicist walk into a bar. The physicist says, I have a neutrino that rarely interacts with people. The priest says, worry not, my son. Your neutrino just needs a little more mass. <laughs> All right, while we're telling science jokes, why can you never trust atoms? Because they make up everything. There are two types of people in the world. Those who can extrapolate from incomplete data All right, here is the idea in Hank Green's video. You just believe in God for no reason at all, like a cosmic teapot or a spaghetti monster like the Pastafarians want to claim. And without evidence, all beliefs are equal, right? Well, you don't believe in a cosmic teapot because there is no evidence for a cosmic teapot. But there are compelling reasons to believe in God. I think out there in our culture, there's this idea that if you're a person of faith, you're a person who just ignores evidence, ignores reason, that you're irrational. Richard Dawkins got at this with the title of his book, The God Delusion. If you believe in God, then you must be delusional. It's sometimes presented that there's a fight between science and faith. But to that, at Sycamore Creek, we say no. God wants you to use your brain. Whatever you believe, you have to go beyond the evidence, but not against it. It's not enough just to say you can't disprove something. So what we want to do today is we want to look at two arguments for believing in God that intersect with science. Two arguments. All right, here, here's the first one. The Big Bang. I'm not talking about the TV show. I'm talking about the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Imagine with me a balloon. And on that balloon are dots. And as you put air in that balloon, those dots start out close together, but they get further and further away the more air in the balloon. That's what's happening in our universe. It's expanding and things are getting further and further away from each other. Space is expanding. But 13.7 billion years ago, everything in the universe was in an infinitesimally small dot, a singular space. Now, the church that I grew up in was skeptical of the Big Bang Theory. They thought, oh, this is just one more atheistic scientific belief that scientists trot out to try to disprove God. But the historical story is actually the exact opposite. Scientists originally didn't like the Big Bang Theory because of what it implied about the universe having a beginning. You see, scientists have a really hard time believing the idea that you can get something from nothing. Their way of thinking is that if there is something, then there must always have been something. There can't be a beginning. This something must have been eternal and uncreated. But as scientists looked up into the night sky, up into the heavens, they saw a different evidence. They saw evidence that pointed in the direction of a beginning. Let's walk through that historical story. It's hard to figure out where to start, but let's start with Vesto Slipher in 1912. Vesto Slipher was the first to notice the red shift in distant galaxies. The red shift is the light equivalent of the Doppler effect. You know the Doppler effect? When a race car goes by? As it's coming towards you, the sound waves are compressed and are a pitch higher. And as the 
race car is going away from you, the sound waves expand and it drops a pitch. The same thing happens with light. When light is traveling away from you, it has a slight red tint to it. This red shift was the first evidence for an expanding universe. Enter into the story, none other than Albert Einstein. Y'all know who he is, right? E equals MC squared. He's the founder of the theory of relativity. And Einstein believed in a static universe, not expanding, not contracting. In 1916, during World War I, he sat down with another scientist, William de Sitter, no pun intended. And William de Sitter believed that the universe had to be expanding. But Einstein didn't like this idea. He said, this circumstance irritates me. In another letter to de Sitter, he wrote, to admit such possibilities seems senseless. So they met in neutral Holland in a cafe to argue things out. In 1928 comes along Edwin Hubble, probably best known for the telescope that's named after him, the Hubble Telescope. Edwin Hubble saw through his telescope that the universe was expanding more and more. And not only that, it was expanding faster and faster. What this meant was that the universe would continue expanding on and on. In fact, it wouldn't be like what some scientists thought, that it would be an oscillating universe. It would expand out and pull back in on itself, expand out and pull back in on itself. But rather, what Hubble showed is that it's expanding and it will just eventually expand into oblivion. Now what scientists understand is that there's not enough matter to have the gravity to pull the universe back in on itself for a big crunch. In fact, the oscillating theory of the universe contradicts the first law of thermodynamics. You see, if the universe expanded out and then crunched back in on itself, the second expansion wouldn't have as much energy as the first. And then if it crunched back in on itself again, the third expansion would have even less energy. It couldn't go on for eternity. In 1927, enter Father George Lamatra. Notice that dog collar around his uh, neck there. George Lamatra was a Catholic priest who is credited as putting together all of these pieces into the final basic theory that we understand as the Big Bang Theory, that there was a beginning of the universe. What scientists now believe is that the universe will eventually burn out all of its energy and die into nothingness. In other words, this is a one-shot universe. No, not that kind of shot. The Big Bang is a point of singularity. It is where time and space begin. There is no time before. There is only time after. Is this the end of what science can answer? Scientists have wrestled with this throughout history. Sir Eddington, the first to prove Einstein's theory of relativity, said, the notion of a beginning is repugnant to me. I simply do not believe that the present order of things started off with a Big Bang. The expanding universe is preposterous. Incredible. It leaves me cold. Well, Eddington, it will eventually leave all of us cold. Walter Nurse, the German chemist who paved the way for the third law of thermodynamics said, to deny the infinite duration of time would be to betray the very foundations of science. Now, this hasn't necessarily been a problem for scientists who are also believers. For example, Robert Jastrow was an astronomer and a believer, and he wrote the book, God and the Astronomers. And this is what he said. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the rock. He is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. You see, the scientific evidence that there is a beginning of the universe is one reason to believe in God. Now, like scientists say, something has to be eternal and the cause of the things that are not eternal. Let me be clear here. We are precariously close to a mistake that Christians often make called the God of the gaps. We don't yet understand or know, so that must be God. The Big Bang Theory does not prove the existence of God, but it is a good reason to believe in the existence of God.
All right, I told you I was going to give you two reasons that intersect with science for believing in God. The first one was the Big Bang. The second one is known as the fine tuning of the universe or the anthropomorphic principle. You can think of this like a radio dial. Do you know a radio dial? This is actually a little before my age even. You see, on a radio dial, you would tune it one way or another, and if you were a little too far off one way, you got static noise, and if you were a little too far off the other way, you got static noise, but if you hit it right on the frequency that the station was broadcasting on, you got the music. The universe is finely tuned like that as well. Or you can think of it as two magnets with a piece of metal right in the middle. And if you have those two magnets perfectly balanced on each side of that piece of metal, it will hold it in place. But if you move one magnet a little too far, the metal will drop. Well, the universe is not just two magnets. It's like 47 magnets. These are called cosmological constants. All matter is held together by balanced forces. This is what keeps things solid. There's an infinite number of ways for this to be wrong, but there's only one way for it to be right. Science doesn't answer how matter has its properties. It only describes what properties it has. Let me give you an example of one constant. It's the ratio of electromagnetic force constant to the gravitational force constant. That's a mouthful. If this force was altered by one in 10 to the 40th, that's 10 times 10, 40 times, stars wouldn't be able to produce elements beyond helium. There would be no carbon, no oxygen, no nitrogen, which is all required for life. You can think of it this way. Imagine dimes stacked from here to the moon, then multiply it by a billion. If one of those dimes was different, life wouldn't be able to exist. The less probable something is, the less appealing it is to explain it by chance. Imagine going to the casino with me, all right? And, and, and you go up to the craps table and you pick up the two dice and, and you throw the dice and you get snake eyes, two ones. You know, that's not that big of a chance. It's a one in 36 chance. But you pick those two dice up and you throw it again and you get snake eyes again. That's not all that unusual. It's a one in 2,096 chance. But you pick up those two dice and you throw them again and you get snake eyes three times in a row. Now that's one in 2,176,782,336 chance. You might start to think that the casino has given you loaded dice. Something is fishy. So let me dumb the consological. So let me dumb the com. So let me dumb the com. This is ridiculous. I'm being dumb trying to say cosmological constants. Let me dumb down the cosmological constants. Let's imagine a one in six chance for 47 constants. What's the chances of that being right? It's six to the 47th power. Google, how much is six to the 47th power? The answer is three undecillion, 742 decillion, 42 nonillion, 951 octillion, 225 septillion, 759 sextillion, 400 quintillion. That, friends, is an astronomically improbable chance. But I told you I was going to dumb it down to one in six chance. That's not actually what it is. All scientists agree on the numbers of probability. The probability that our universe would exist as it is, is a one in 10 to the 154th power chance. Google, what is 10 to the 154th power? The answer is 9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
the leading theory is the multiverse theory or the many worlds theory. Now we're starting to sound like serious science fiction. We exist in a universe which coexists with a multitude of others in the same physical space. A certain brief period of time, an area of their space overlaps an area of ours. You see, if you have an infinite number of worlds or parallel universes, then you have an infinite number of throws of the dice. So infinitely small probable things have the possibility of actually happening. This theory plays out in one of two ways. Either we happen to be in the one universe that got it right, or every possibility that could happen is happening simultaneously in multiple parallel universes and other dimensions. In this universe, the Allies thankfully won World War II, but in a parallel universe, like the man in the high castle, the Nazis and the Japanese, the Axis, won World War II. Now there are some problems with this theory. One of the problems is that it is mathematically internally consistent but there is no evidence for it. Zero evidence. That doesn't mean that we won't find evidence someday. But the second problem with it from a Christian perspective is, well, where did the multiverse come from? You see, the scientific evidence for the fine tuning of the universe is a second reason to believe in God. So let's go back to that question that we started with. Can you justify faith? Perhaps, is there evidence for God? There is evidence and there are reasons for faith. So I'd love to hear how you're interacting with these two ideas. Let's have a conversation in the comments. Which of these two reasons for believing in God is most compelling to you? The Big Bang Theory or the fine tuning of the universe? Or is there another reason that you find compelling evidence to believe in God? Let's talk about that. I don't understand a word that man just said. <laughs> My mind is completely blown. Mark Raymond said, anyone else hear that whooshing sound? It's this episode going over our collective heads. <laughs> oh my goodness. So we even talked about this earlier in the week. and I'm still un unclear. But the biggest thing for me was that fine tuning, that one missing dime, that one DNA. I, I went for my birthday a couple years ago. I went and I saw Neil Hilborn. He's a poet and he was performing his work. It was my birthday and I went to have my book signed. And he was like, it's your birthday. You're awesome. Have a free shirt. So I picked out his shirt, uh, and the shirt says, I am just carbon and bad timing. This doesn't mean my parents didn't want me, let me be clear, because they did. Um, yay me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that I am me is like this small chance that I'm going to be who I am made up. I'm carbon, and maybe not bad timing, but timing. Timing. Unexplainable timing. Tiny, tiny little tuning. Oh, there was some really bad TV show. It was like Journeyman, I think was the name. Sure. Way back in the day. <laughs> and like he could like time travel and he missed the month of like his daughter being born. So oh, it was a no. son when he came back. <laughs> uh, that was that digression. We didn't plan that. Whoa, sorry. Whoa. <laughs> sorry, Tom. Whoa. Sorry, Tom. Okay. I am getting some crazy, funny things in I the bet. comments. Oh, a lot goodness. of people are saying fine tuning. That's where I land. I think fine tuning is fascinating. Yeah. And the idea that if one tiny little thing was off, like there couldn't even be life on earth. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Bob Trout, thank you for our uh, fellow. Well, I guess you, I call him a scientist. He works. Yeah, he's in, a scientist in um, yeah. infection yeah. prevention. He's so very fine tuning to extends right to the human body as well. Yes, it does. Yeah, so that's really cool. 
Yeah. And Dwayne Dietrich is up in here talking about string theory and stuff. So, I mean, oh, I, don't I don't know, know what's what happening. I'm not but, sure wh what it is really, but yeah. I'm glad you're there. Yes. yes. He yes. also said, does um, the multiverse theory be like explain deja vu? Ooh. Oh, don't do that to me. Right? I'm getting a, so I think we're having a lot of fun with this episode, even it's though like we're the all matrix confused. where your brain is catching up. Yeah. Yes. That's where I'm that's where I am right now. We're gonna see if there's more answers or more scintillating brain blowing stuff. I'm nervous. <laughs> Here I'm we nervous. go. <laughs> what a great conversation we're having. Thanks so much for joining in and engaging us today. God who created out of an overflow of an abundance of love. And now we're back to Psalm 19. We don't often do a call and response at Sycamore Creek, but even if you're sitting at home, I want to invite you to do this. Say it out loud. I'll start with the call on the screen, and you say out loud the response on the screen. This call and response is written from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. We look for glory and celebrate that handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. We listen for that speech and open ourselves up to that knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Teach us, God, to hear your wordless speech, to behold your matchless wisdom, and to never take for granted the wonder of your magnificent creation. And all who agreed said, Amen. A priest and a physicist walk into a bar and and ask to connect with you. If you only do one of these things this morning, fill out our connection card so we can get to know you. You're a first time guest. Let us send you a free book. You'll get through this by Max Lucado. All you got to do is fill out a connection card. The God Particle Generation Theater production has been postponed until further notice. Keep watching your announcements. We'll let you know when we're ready to premiere this conversation made play between a scientist and a baker. It's time to fess up. You still have some hoarded toilet paper, don't you? Why not donate it to a neighbor in need at the Compassion Closet? To help with social distancing, bring your bleach, bar soap, paper towels, and deodorant to Greater Harvest New Testament Church. Call ahead Tuesday and Wednesday between 10 and 2. We're thankful for you, and we're thankful for our community. Sigmore Creek is spending Thanksgiving with Kingdom Life Church. We'll join their virtual worship on November 29th at 11 a.m. at facebook.com slash KLC Lansing. Celebrate in Thanksgiving with friends on November 29th with us. Type in SCCMI in your app store to connect with us through Sycamore Creek's app. You can give through that app, listen to sermons online, read your Bible, and fill out the connection card all right from your phone. Not interested in the app but still want to give online? Head to sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give and you'll have options there too. We're turning 20 in 2020. Here's our 2020 challenge. We'll donate $20 to a charity for the first 20 people to fill out a connection card. Say that 20 times fast while you're filling out that connection card and choose a charity on the list for us to donate $20 to. Your giving inspires people and makes things possible at Sycamore Creek, like putting together food baskets for our community. Your giving allows Sycamore Creek to come together to be there for people like Marion and Paul and many others like them to help put food on the table, especially during this difficult time. Amen, Sycamore Creek. Let's keep blessing each other this morning. We're going to take it back to the studio to see what's next. Hey, friends. So what's something your family does to care for God's creation? We're, uh, we've got a little bit of snow happening, yeah. but we're still celebrating all of God's creation, even Look the winter, we are about this. with uh, this beautiful <laughs> classic. Uh, classic. Oh. There it goes. There it goes. <laughs> oh no, it's crashed, and that's and that's all right. Uh, it, no problem. We were just about to listen. What to is all that yours. in the multiverse? It worked. In the multiverse, maybe it worked. It maybe it worked. Why do we live in this one? This is the darkest timeline because we don't get to hear Jeremy sing all yours in yeah. harmony with himself. With himself. Um, with himself. In this very studio. So 
Uh, what's a way that your family cares for God's creation, Erin? Um, we are the people who, when no matter where we are, if we're camping or whatever, we bring along a big Rubbermaid to re- bring all of our recyclables home. Yes. yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Which is smelly and disgusting. And Do you rinse makes them me feel really good. And wash them and stuff? I mean, most, most of, them, of the time. Most but of the like, time. Oh. You got like a hummus Sometimes dish. Sometimes it's you like know what I'm late at night. I feel that. Not. I feel that. that yet. We are also diligent recyclers. Talia is a really avid crafter and she likes to, you know, take cardboard and plastic and cut it up and create new things, usually rocket ships, space. We love it. Yep. Um, and or like houses for little stuffed animals. We love that. Yep. And we go beyond recycling just those materials. Um where where I live in my neighborhood, we have a clothing recycling program. Agreed. And that that fabric recycling and clothing recycling is really important because a lot of that stuff ends up in landfills, and that's really important to me. Yep. So we recycle as well. I try really hard, if I can, not to just throw stuff away that I don't need anymore, but to see if I can give it to somebody or donate it. Um, sometimes, if I think something's too gross to rinse out, and I like try to throw it away, then other people will be like, "No, you can't!" And, like rinse it out for me. Um, but the yes. other thing that I've been getting into lately <laughs> is like how super important it is not to waste food. Yeah. So yes. if something doesn't get eaten, it goes in the fridge and it's going to get eaten at the next meal or yes. the next snack, especially my kids' lunches when oh, they're yeah. like, I'm not hungry anymore. And left overnight saves your budget and your time. Yes. You love yes. left overnight. So Teresa Miller is my favorite. She says, no Christmas wrapping paper. I made reusable fabric bags and have used them since the early 80s. That's I want to see beautiful. that fabric. Yay, Teresa. You know, my grandfather used to wrap things in newspaper. We called it Papa Wrapping. I still do that. It's wonderful. I didn't it know was, it had a name. It was great. Papa Wrapping. You can have that too. <laughs> Thank you. We've got all yours back up so we can continue in worship with this. for the oceans You command the wind and waves Standing over every season God, you reign You reign And it's all yours The day and the night The earth and the sky God, it's all yours Every breath We're taking in, we pour out again in worship. God, you authored our beginning. You have numbered all our days. Your love for us is everlasting beyond the grave. You reign. And it's all yours, the day and the night, the earth and the sky. God, it's all yours, every breath we're taking in, we pour out again in worship. And it's all yours, the day and the night, the earth and the sky. It's all yours, every breath we're taking in, we pour out again in worship. The mountains rise and lift your name, the oceans roar and shout your praise, everything is yours. The mountains rise and lift your name. The oceans roar and shout your praise. Everything is yours. Yes, everything is yours. And it's all yours. The day and the night, the earth and the sky. 
it's all yours Every breath we're taking in We pour out again In worship And it's all yours The day and the night The earth and the sky God, it's all yours Every breath we're taking in we pour out again in worship. God, it's all yours. God, it's all yours. It's all yours. And you know, you can't do this now, but doesn't it just feel great to bring your own coffee mug, bring your own bag? I the feel supermarket. superior. To feel my like past I'm in self. tune with nature. Back in the day, my mom used to bring her own bags because they would give her a nickel for each bag she used. Yeah, that's insane. And she said, that nickel in my pocket's better than being in theirs. <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the comments uh, that people are saying about something that their family does to care for God's creation? Lots of people talking about recycling. Amen. And um, we've kind of devolved of, into the. There was something. Oh, Jeremy. working hard to reduce my contribution to the landfill. Oh, Thank yes. you, Denise. So lots of different things that people are talking about. Wonderful. That's beautiful. And we, we encourage you to continue to care for God's creation, even, even as the months get colder and snowier. <laughs> if you're just tuning in with us this morning, don't worry. You didn't miss much. We've got a worship watch party starting at 11 a.m. So you can still come back and you can still see everything that you missed and join in on the conversation. Come back next week. It'll be here on the South Lansing Facebook for a uh, priest and a physicist walk into a bar part three, or you can head to facebook.com slash KLC Lansing to join us at Kingdom Life Church with uh, Pastor Koi Boyer. So I'm really excited about that. Me I think that would be really fun. And then here it is, episode three, Priest and a Physicist Walk Into a Bar. We'll be talking about science and free will. So you can catch both of those. And don't worry, you're not going to miss it. If you miss episode three, you can always watch it on our YouTube page. That's super cool. The magic of the universe. The magic. Thanks for tuning in with us this morning in worship. Peace. Sing again. Sing again.